In this video lecture, we'll discuss some basic ideas of interaction design and methods of design. In particular, we're going to talk about the ideas in chapters 1 and 6 of The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. What is chapter 1 about? Chapter 1, the main idea, is that many objects convey information poorly. Very, very poorly. Instead of conveying useful information to their users, what is this? How does it work? What should you do with it? Instead, these objects, they, do, they hide their ideas behind them. What can they do the user can't tell? The solution to this problem is human-centered design, abbreviated as HCD. Human-centered design puts human needs, capabilities, and behavior first. It emphasizes what people need, what people can do, and how people actually act versus what the designer thinks or wants or needs. Please note, human-centered design is the opposite of system-centered design, and making something user-friendly is not human-centered design. I'm going to digress from Chapter 1 for just a moment to talk about system-centered design and user-friendliness. What is user-centered design and why is it bad? User-centered design is built around what the device or system can do. It is easy for the engineer or programmer to create, and it's based on what the creator thinks is interesting or useful. What does all this mean? Instead of being focused on what people want, it's focused on what the machine can provide for people. Or the engineer or programmer will take the route of least resistance. I can make this thing very easily, so I'll just make this. I don't care if anyone's going to use it, but I'm just going to make it anyway. Or sometimes the engineer or programmer will, will think, this is kind of cool. Yeah, I'm going to try to do this, and if it works, excellent, I'll include this. But what if the user doesn't want it or need it? For example, you've all probably used a microwave oven at some point in your life, right? Ask yourself this question, though. How many of those controls ever get used? For example, the popcorn button. Most microwaves have a popcorn button. How many of you use it? How many of you make popcorn? If you do make popcorn, how do you know that the popcorn button actually is the right one? Is it giving the right power level? Is it giving the right time length? How do you know? Odds are it may not. What's wrong then with being user-friendly? If we don't make something system-centered, perhaps it should be easy for the user to use, correct? You would think so, because if something is user-friendly, it's then easy and people will like it, right? The problem is, sometimes things can be too easy. This is a real alert that went out to the residents of Hawaii a few years ago. They were warned that, uh, basically, North Korea is launching a missile and they're going to blow up Hawaii. Go hide. The problem is that this was not a real emergency notice. It was supposed to be a system test. The person operating the system clicked the wrong button and sent out a real emergency message instead of testing it inside the system. Was it the user's fault? The answer is no, it wasn't the user's fault. It was the designer's fault. Whoever made this system made it so it was too easy, too user-friendly to send out a real message. Also, sometimes if something is user-friendly, you can lock people into doing something that they didn't really want to get in the first place. So back to chapter one and what it's about. As we've said, objects need to convey information to their users, but many of them do it poorly, and the solution is to use human-centered design. Why do we want to use human-centered design? Three reasons. First off, usability. Human behavior isn't actually rational, so we need to adapt our machines, our systems, to what people actually do. We need to then also use human-centered design to improve the user experience. If people are happy with the experience they have using our systems, then the odds are they will be happier using them at all. 
and then ethics. We always need to do the right thing. What the right thing is can be complex and hard to determine sometimes, but we need to we need to stand by our users and do the best we can for them. So let's talk about communication. Norman says that communication is especially important when things go wrong. For example, I want a green car. All right, do you want a car that is painted green? Do you want a car that is ecologically responsible to drive? Or do you perhaps want something that is covered in grass? It could be any one of the three just based on green car. How about this? The little girls, they see the cute little kittens and they want to go play with them. Well, that would be great if those were actually kittens that they aren't. I'll give you a second to figure out what they are if you haven't already. So speaking of communication between users and designers, one of the main ways that it is done is through manuals and the like. So oftentimes when things go wrong, we blame the user and say, go read the freaking manual. Well, that both is and isn't good. Sometimes, yes, operators just do make errors, but it's usually a design problem on the back end so that the interface, the communication product, the design of the product itself wasn't done well, it wasn't human-centered, and so then people are forced to go and read the manual. Don't expect your reader, your user, to go and find the manual and page through it. Odds are they won't want to, and many people never read manuals at all. So we need to make sure that we use human-centered design, whether we are a technical communicator working on designing products, or we are an interaction designer working on designing interfaces, we need to make sure that we use uh, human-centered design to make sure that we establish good communication, subtle communication, between ourselves and the users. We're going to talk about some specific topics in Chapter 1. We both have major concepts and vocabulary. You'll need to know these for the rest of the semester. So if you haven't already, I suggest very strongly that you take notes. The major concepts we're talking about are that design must be discoverable and understandable, and that human-centered design is human-centered. Vocabulary terms. We need to talk about affordances, signifiers, constraints, mapping, feedback, conceptual models, and system images. Let's start talking about the major concepts first. Good design is discoverable and understandable. What does that mean? Discoverability is the user's ability to figure out what a product does, how that product works, and what actions are possible with that product. Understanding means the user can understand the relationship among controls, actions, and intended results. For example, take a look at the light switches on the right. Can the user figure out what these objects do just by blundering through and seeing, hey, what if I touch this? What happens? Is it discoverable? Odds are yes. The user can reach out, play with it, and discover that if, it move, if the user moves the object up and down, the lights go on and off. Then, understanding. Can the user comprehend the relationship between the controls and actions? Generally speaking, yes. Most switches, you move the light switch up, the lights go on. You move the switch down, the lights go off. Hmm, what if I want to make the lights go on? What should I do? I should move that switch up. Odds are, the design of these light switches leads the user to be able to discover what the light switch is about and how it works, and understand how to get the result that she or he wants. HCD is human-centered. What does it mean? It means that we actually need to think about our designs. We need to have formal, or at least formal-ish, planning behind the creation of any object or process that we work on. We don't just make a product. Instead, we think about it. What does the user want? How is the user going to interact with this? And then we design that thing so that the user is at the center of our design. 
So we always want to emphasize what it is that the user wants, the user needs. We want to avoid being system-centered. Vocabulary terms. We'll talk about each of these in turn. To begin, affordances. An affordance is, quote, a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of the agent that determine just how the object could possibly be used. What does this actually mean? In short, it is something that the user can do with an object. In the case of a light switch, what are the affordances? The affordances are moving it up and down and making the lights go on and off. Signifiers. A signifier is any perceivable indicator that communicates an appropriate relation behavior to a person. What does that mean? Perceivable, the person has to be able to understand or notice what is happening, and it communicates the appropriate behavior. So what should the user do? What signifies the user? What tells the user, hey, you need to use me like this? Well, in this case, if we look at a light switch, hmm, it appears to be free floating. Um, does it come in and out if I grab it and pull on it? No, it doesn't. It, it stays put. Uh, what if I push on it a little bit? Oh, it goes click up. What if I push it on it? It goes click down. Hmm, it's about the size of my finger, so it seems that if I put my finger here and apply pressure, that would work that way. So these are signifiers. Constraints. Constraints are limits. We'll talk in a lot of detail about constraints in chapter four, but if, at a very basic level, if we look at the constraints of a light switch, what can we do with it? Not a whole lot besides move it up and down. Can we go side to side? No. In and out? No. Can we balance it in the middle? Maybe so, but it may or may not work. It may snap automatically up or down, so it may not have a balance point. Those are constraints. Mapping. Mapping is the user's mental model of what's going on between two elements of the sets. So we can have mapping in spatial, spatial relationships. We can have mapping between conceptual groupings and other things. When we talk about light switches, this is a very good example. Let's assume that you walk into a room, reach your hand out to the right, and you find two switches there. Would you expect the switch that is closest to you to light up the room that is part of the room that is closest to you or the part of the room that is furthest away from you? Odds are you flip that switch and you expect that close switch to light up close to you, expect the far switch to light up far from you. That's mapping. Feedback. Feedback is communicating the results of an action. This may seem, well, obvious, but at the same time, think about it. How many times have you used a machine, a system, an object, and not gotten any feedback of what you did? You pressed the button, you flipped the switch, and you couldn't tell anything happened. Did that make you happy? Probably not. Could you tell if you had accomplished your task? Probably not. So in the case of a light switch, what is going on? Is there feedback from a light switch? Probably yes. You move the switch, it usually goes click somehow, and a light goes on. Both that tactile feedback, the audio, audible feedback, and the visual feedback, those are all feedbacks that say you did this and you did it correctly or did not do it correctly. A conceptual model is an explanation, usually highly simplified, of how something works. So let's think about electricity generally. When you go in and flip a switch, what's going on behind the scenes? Well, when you move the switch, metal contacts are being made, a circuit is being completed, electrons start to flow from positive to negative, and then because we are using uh, alternating current, the electrons switch direction and they go back and forth, back and forth, usually about 60 times a second. So the average user doesn't really need to know that, do they? Instead, 
what conceptual model do you use for electricity? One of the common ones that people use is they treat electricity as a fluid. It's not actually a fluid, but it acts kind of like one. So we say, turn on the juice, and the juice is flowing. The power is flowing. Is it actually? No, but that's our conceptual model. That's our highly simplified explanation of how electricity works. Finally, we have system image. A system image is the information available to a user from all sorts of places. For example, ads, salespeople, uh, manuals, what other your friends have to say, your previous life experience, anything that's available to understand the product or service. So you probably have a very robust, a very strong system image of a light switch because you've used them all your life. You've read about them, you've seen them in TV and in movies. So you have a very strong system image. At the same time, sometimes people don't have strong system images of the things that you are trying to design for. So if it is a new device, something people don't have experience with, you have to help provide that system image. As an example, let's think light switches again. These are basic light switches. You've seen them before. And then we've got basic light switches kind of like this one as well. So it's just a big uh, semi-flat. It's a rocker switch. It goes back and forth. It's kind of hard to see, but there is a little break right in the middle. Let's add on a feature. We've got a dimmer switch. So we can push up, turn it on, the big paddle on off, and then on the side we've got a little slider. Generally speaking, up is usually bright, down is usually dim. So I figure that, yeah, I've, I can discover what this is about. I can understand it. I have figured out its affordances. It goes on off. It goes bright dim. It has constraints. I can't pull it side to side or in and out. I can map ah, this one. This switch is connected to that thing over there. It'll give me feedback. There's a, usually a click. I can also tell by the position up or down where uh, it is. The feedback, does the light get brighter or dimmer? Does the fan go faster or slower? The conceptual model, I know that there are not elves behind the scenes, but instead I'm thinking, ah, the power is flowing. My system image, I know from previous life experiences of how this works. And I've also probably read the instructions when I installed it, that if I slide up, it'll go brighter, I slide down, it'll go dimmer. Hey, fine, fantastic, that's really cool. Then we've got this switch. It's a little different, but it does the same thing. It has an on and off, it's got a slider, and this thing actually has a little uh, green light that tells me as well, this is feedback, is it on, is it off? But then we've got this. This horrible thing, this is a switch that it does much the same, but instead it's a digital dimmer. So we've got an on and off plate, and then we've got an up and down rocker switch on the right hand side. And on the left we've got little lights. Now ideally we have the same things going on here that we do in all the other switches, but it never worked for me. This thing just gave me fits. I had one of these in my garage. I have LED lights in there. I turn the switch on. I want super bright. If I want it to be darker, I want to make it, you know, slide it down, make it darker. It never worked right. I was never able to get good feedback from this thing. I was never able to get um, a good conceptual model of exactly how it was supposed to work because sometimes I'd press it, the lights would be super bright. Sometimes I'd press it, it would be super dark. Maybe it was the length of time I pressed it. I don't know. I didn't have good feedback. Finally, I ended up ripping the thing out. It cost me 50 bucks, and I installed one that cost $20, and I'm twice as happy. Let's talk about Chapter 6. Norman's topic for Chapter 6 is solving problems is not addressing problems root causes. You need, as designers, technical communicators, interaction designers, you need to figure out what's actually going on behind the scenes in order to come up with good solutions for people. The solution for you is to use design thinking. Design thinking puts human needs, capabilities, and behaviors first. So we need, again, 
to emphasize not what it is that is easy to do, or what we think might be kind of cool just to play around with. No, we need to emphasize what is it that our people want to do with it. What do our, what can our people actually do? How are people actually going to act with the things that we design? What should we do then? In order to implement design thinking, we need to use the double diamond design model and the HCD process. I'll talk about each of these things and then combine them together. The double diamond design model looks kind of like this. I'm not going to talk at length about it, but I'm going to move my cursor over here so you can see what's going on. First off, we have a problem of some kind. This is our start point. We're going to discover what the problem is about. We'll do research, try to figure out what is the quote unquote real problem and not just the surface level problem. At some point, once we've got enough research done, we start to then to narrow down and figure out what is actually the real problem. At some point, we then define our problem and say, okay, it's not just that users need to do X, but users need to do Y in order to be able to do X. So then, how can we help users do Y? That's where we start brainstorming and coming up with new ideas. New ideas, new ideas, new ideas. You get a whole bunch of new ideas, and then you start narrowing those ideas down, which work, which don't work, which are possible, which are impossible, and eventually you come and end at a particular one solution. Next, let's talk about the human-centered design process. It's a cyclical process. It has ideation, prototyping, testing, and observing. So we ideate, we come up with an idea, we prototype that idea, maybe come up with a little solution, we test that solution, we observe to see did it work, did it not work, was it what we expected, is it not what we expected, how so? We then ideate again, come up with new ideas, and repeat the process over and over and over again until we get something we like. So let's combine these two. We've got the double diamond design model and human-centered design. You'll notice that inside each of these blobs, that inside each of these diamonds, that's where we have this going on. So we define the problem, ideate. What is maybe the problem? We have an idea of what that problem might be. We test to see if our idea is correct, observe the results. If it is great, we can move on. If not, we're going to come up with new ideas and test over and over and over and over again. Finally, we come up with our problem definition. We figure out what our problem is. We then start coming up with possible solutions. We ideate, we prototype, we test, we observe the results, and continue over and over and over again until we come up with the final solution. While we're doing this, we need to focus on activities and not tasks. What does that mean? We need to differentiate between the two. Activities are high-level structures. They're collected sets of small tasks that are performed together to achieve a high-level goal. Tasks, then, are small and discrete elements of activities. They're individual operations that are directed toward a single and low-level goal. So let's say, for example, I want to turn on the lights. My activity is flipping the switch. My tasks involved with flipping the switch are reaching out my hand placing my hand on the switch, moving the hand up or down, or perhaps pressing in. Those are the individual tasks that go toward the higher level activity. Now conceivably, a higher level activity could be even more complex. So let's say that I want to um, create this video for you all. My activities would include such things, well that's, that's the activity. Now my, my tasks then are creating the slides. So not only do I walk into the room, reach over, touch the light, then come and sit down, I could say that, well, my task is actually just turning on the light. So it depends how abstract you want to get. You can take tasks down to a very, very granular level. At some point then, when you are talking about really complex things, your, your individual 
tasks, that uh, your individual activities that are made up of really low-level tasks, those become smaller tasks toward bigger activities. So please don't make the mistake that activity one activity is always an activity. When you start breaking things down, tasks are really, really small, activities are bigger. You can have multiple activities to make a bigger activity, in which case those sub-activities could conceivably be considered tasks. It gets a little complex, but don't worry about it. The big idea, you need to differentiate between high-level structures, big things that you're aiming for, and then small individual actions to get toward those activities you're looking to complete. So when we talk about these various ideas, we're going to think about doors, in particular, Norman doors. There's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it. Did you ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? I feel like Roman Mars would know about this. This is 99% invisible, and those doors you hate are called Norman doors. Um, what's a Norman door? Don Norman wrote the essential book about design. He is the Norman of the Norman door. All right, and where is this guy? You must go to San Diego. Okay. <laughs> what I am. Well, he's been a professor of psychology, professor of cognitive science, professor of computer science, a vice president of advanced technology at Apple. But for our purposes. I was spending a year in England and I got so frustrated with my inability to use the light switches and the water taps and the doors even that I wrote this book. If I continually get a door wrong, is it my fault? No. In fact, if you continually get it wrong, it's a good thing. But if other people continue to get it wrong, good sign that it's a really bad door. A Norman door is one where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. Why does it need an instruction manual? That is, why do you have to have a sign that says push or pull? Why not make it obvious? It can be obvious, if it's designed right. There are a couple of really simple basic principles of design, and one of them I'll call discoverability. When I look at something, I should be able to discover what operations I can do. The principle applies to a whole lot more than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today. You look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once or twice, or even triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today, commonly known as user or human-centered design. I decided at one point the word user was a bit degrading. Why not call people people? And it's amazingly simple and amazingly seldom practiced. We call it iterative, which just goes around in a circle. We go out and we observe what is happening today. We observe people doing the past. And from that, we say, oh, we have some ideas. Here's what we should perhaps propose to do. Then you prototype your solution and test it. Quite often, these are wrong at first. But each time we go around the circle, we do a better job of making the device until the point we're actually making something that really works. And this process has spread all over the world. And it turns out, it's improving lives from better everyday things like the ones that Don wrote about. To using the same process to solve huge problems in public health in developing countries. Water. Sanitation. Farming. Lots more. So would it be a better human-centered door? An ideal door is one that as I walk up to it and walk through it, I'm not even aware that I had opened the door and shut it. So if you had a door which had a flat plate, what could you do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is push. So see, you wouldn't need a sign. Flat plate, you push. 
This kind of push bar with the piece sticking out on one side works well too. So you can see what side you're supposed to push on. The vertical bars could go either way. A simple little hand thing though sort of indicates hold. But we still have terrible, terrible doors in the world. So many of them. There are lots of things in life that are fairly standardized and therefore whether I buy this house or not is not a function of whether it has good doors in it. And so, uh, except for safety reasons, doors tend not to be improved. But the tyranny of bad doors must end. I think that it's a really good sign. In fact, they put a pull handle on it to push. And it should be a flat panel right here. And that, I think, is a pull handle. That's right, that's right. Fair enough, Becky. I agree. You're right, Becky. You're goddamn right. And if we all thought like you, well, we might just design a better world together. It won't open because it's a security door. What the f*** are you two doing? Hey, so as you can see, since I started making this video, they've uh, since changed the door a little bit. Uh, I guess it's a step in the right direction. Thank you so much for watching, and to 99% Invisible, one of my favorite podcasts. It was so much fun to collaborate with them. Thank you, and check them out on any podcast app or 99pi.org. There's this door on the... And that's what I've got for you. So, we've talked about Chapter 1 and 6 of Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. Please remember all the vocab we've talked about, the fundamental ideas, and the uh, double diamond design model, and how human-centered design, the iterative process, works. Thanks very much. We'll be using these ideas all the rest of the semester. Tenth floor.